uh, incorporated in Sunnyvale in 2019, um, been the long committed to open source. Uh, obviously, everybody knows Luca, uh, but uh, yeah, one of the original maintainers, let's say, and uh, early contributors to the project for sure. Uh, and we've been working with open source since uh, 2009. Uh, bunch of maintainers in the team, JGIM maintainers as well, which are probably rarer than uh, gold dust. Let's get started straight away. What's new in Gary 310? Uh, I'm going to start with, um, okay, so Gary 310 in numbers, um, so you can see Gary Core, uh, we've had, so this is specifically for 310, so between 3.9 and 3.10, we've had 40 contributors to this version, and another 34 for JGit and plugins. Uh, if we're looking at the number of commits, roughly, roughly the same, um, just shows how plugins and, and JG itself are like quite integral to Garrett and yeah, how a lot of development, uh, development is also happening on there. If we're looking at the organizations, we've got Google being the first contributing to Garrett Core, uh, Ask Gary Forge second, uh, Linaro, or you can read that as Qualcomm. Um, that's just the name that shows up there. Um, and SAP being the main contributors. Uh, when, when we're looking at JG and Garrett, uh, sorry, and Gary plugins, we can see Gary Forge uh, coming out on top, I guess. Uh, that's probably because of our work with poor replication, multi site, high availability, event broker, and all of that. Um, SAP also contributes a lot to JGit specifically, uh, and then all of the others, uh, as you would expect. Uh, interestingly, we've got Acme Gating as well, which they are the company that looks after Zool, if, if you guys know about Zool. We actually use uh, Zool and Jenkins and also an open source CI CD system from Google that's called Lucy. So you use three of them at the same time. It works. <laughs> uh, top contributors for the last six months. We've got Luca topping the chart here. Uh, and then if you guys have been involved with the Gary community, you're, you recognize these names, Edwin, Ben, uh, long time contributors. So yeah, good to see them still involved with the project. Uh, and then finally, if we look at the number of commits between 3.10 compared to 3.8 and 3.9, so, so, somewhat, somewhat like, yeah, leveling out, stable. Um, this is what, the last 18 months? Quickly touching on upgrading to 3.10 with zero downtime. Um, so it's only possible from 3.9. Uh, you can't do it from previous versions. This is not due to any schema change, but it's because the Lucene index has been updated. We always update Lucene Index between version, but in this case, the update is different. We actually update the Lucene library. And you know, if you jump from one Lucene library to the other, the next one supports only the previous version of the index files. So in that case, even if there are, let's say, no schema changes, we can't do really more than one jump. Otherwise, it would have been also two jumps. Cool native packages. So if you're using Docker, this might interest you. Um, Alma Linux has been upgraded to version 9.3. Ubuntu to version 20 uh, stays on the same version. So nothing new there. Um, so yeah, let's talk about what's new. Uh, we've got a little bit of time, but let's keep the questions to the end maybe just cause I've put this in descending order of interest to me. So I don't want to lose too much time on the less interesting. Um, <laughs> Although this is quite interesting, uh, which is improving the index management for admins. Um, so there's, they've added a bunch of REST APIs. Uh, so now you can list indexes. You can get the information on an index uh, alongside its version as well, which you couldn't do previously. Uh, and most importantly, you can create snapshots of indexes, which is really useful for backups. So you don't need to go into a read-only mode version anymore. Uh, which is hugely uh, helpful if, if you're running backups. Uh, some of our clients, they've got problems. Even if we do like five seconds downtime for the backup, they're going to get failures on their build system and stuff. So this helps. And then Delta indexing and index version. This means that uh, you can do incremental reindexes. So you, if, if you need to reindex something, you only reindex what's, what's stale. You don't need to reindex everything. So this could mean taking down the re-index time from potentially days to potentially a few seconds, right? It will, Gary will know what has gone stale in that, in that meantime and only re-index what, what needs to be re-indexed. Uh, so yeah, if you've got multi-primary set up uh, with independent indexes, this is extremely helpful because it brings down the amount of time that you need to bring up new machines massively. Less email spams. 
who who doesn't like less emotes? Uh, we've had we've had users in the in time complaining that they get too many emotes from Gary and they just put it in the bin. Uh, so we've tried to reduce a bit of that noise. So if additional reviewers and CCs are added, you're not going to get an email. It doesn't doesn't really matter too much. And also, if people um, vote or uh, uh, yeah vote on a node the patch set that uh, and, and then that vote ends up not applying to the latest patch set so for for whatever reason you're not going to get emailed because the latest state of the change hasn't changed so yeah there's, there's really nothing to notify there right native log delish, deletion so we did the native log rotation but we didn't do deletion so uh currently you can lo rotate logs in garrett uh so if they're either bigger than the set in size or older than the set amount of days you can just like create a new file zip the old one and keep it there on the server but up to now admins have always needed something else to then do the actual deletion itself uh now it's just a configuration parameter in garrett uh long time to delay to keep support for secondary email um so now you can update uh the committees via the ui the, the, there's a handy drop down in the committee email uh yeah it it can be handy maybe not like specifically with work accounts but if you work in open source a lot this can come in handy or yeah we've got this scenario the robo comment section of the gary ui has been deprecated for like quite some time three six i believe deprecated robo comments and we recommend using the checks api which is a, a different section in the Gary UI and what this does is it helps massively with reducing the size of the repository because all the comments are not stored in the meta ref anymore so robot comments used to actually be part of the repo itself and stored um in git um checks api moves that um storage onto the ci system itself and then that you can write a plugin that fetches that information so you're not storing it in Gary and you just fetch it whenever someone loads, loads that change. So that helps a lot with keeping your repos in good health. However, Robo comments had some extra features that weren't really available in human comments, which was a bit annoying. Uh, so they've basically brought that feature parity to human comments, which what means is uh, there's a structured, they've added a field where you can suggest your fixes via the REST API. And then using this field, you can actually apply them using the apply fixes API. However, this only applies if you're using the API. So if you go to the UI and do a suggest fix, that doesn't get stored in that special field. It gets stored as part of the message and just rendered in a fancy way. Um, so this only applies to human comments created programmatically. I know it's a bit confusing, but that's that's how it works we now fully support project and change number um as the unique id so probably most people i would say are used to using the triplet project branch and change id uh, to identify a change however this is not always unique it can be ambiguous right well because on the server side on the repo what you store it by is the change number uh and how it works is when you push a new change, uh, we look up in the index if we already associate that change ID with a set with a change number. But if the index is stale or something for some reason, and you push another change with a change ID, it will create a new change number. So, yeah, so it can happen. In reality, this only happens. Uh, well, after we fixed the bug in 3.5, this only happens uh, if someone like cancels a push halfway through, like, because we don't have the trans uh, transactions in like overall. So there's, we've got transactions in Git, but you don't have transaction between updating Git and the index, right? So let's say the repo gets updated, but then the guy just control sees his push uh, before the index is completed. Uh, that's going to not create the index entry. So if he repushes that change ID, it will create a duplicated change. So you're going to have two change IDs uh, with two different change numbers, right? Uh, so in, in the review, if you go and look at the refs, those are going to be keyed by change number. Yeah, so project change number is the recommended way of identifying changes.
Uh, and what they've done, sorry, <laughs> uh, what they've done in this release is we couldn't query by change project change number, which is a bit annoying because it's what we're recommending to use. So now you can query by change uh, using this key. There's an API to list active features flags. So yeah, you need some uh, config server experiment. You can, you can hit that endpoint and it will tell you what, which one of your features are enabled, which ones aren't. Uh, it can be handy uh, if you want to figure out on that specific server what's enabled and what isn't. F uh, full support for imported changes. So this is a cool one. So if you looked uh, our representation from Matthias Son, uh, is it two months ago? Or two, two, two months, yeah, two months ago. I think it was the last Gary Meets actually. Um, we migrated the whole of the Clips Foundation projects from their Gary installation to Gary Hub uh, using this feature, imported changes. Uh, this was done with no downtime. However, it wasn't perfect. There were, there were a few problems here and there. Uh, so we've worked on it, we fixed them. Uh, so now there shouldn't be any more issues. Uh, what we fixed was there was some CI CD integrations for imported changes. So tying back with what I was saying earlier, obviously if you're importing changes from a different server, you could have changes with the same change number. Uh, these are gonna still be unique per project, but the, you could have the same change number across projects which is fine because it's stored per, per repo anyway. So, uh, however, that wasn't supported. So before uh, the, CI, uh, the, the index didn't, couldn't make the differentiation. So you could actually end up building the wrong, the wrong change. So we fixed that. Uh, also draft comments and start changes wasn't really working. So that's, that's been fixed. Uh, Cause again, the ambiguous change number was quite confusing for it. So th this means that now we fully support live migrations from Garrett 3.6 onwards. Uh, you need to have different servers and import changes from one server to the other, but it's, it's doable. Rebase merge commits. I feel like for us maintainers, this is a big one. Uh, I don't know how many people actually have this use case in their companies, but if you're migrating between branches, I was going to do a demo of this, but I think it's just going to be more too confusing and it's going to be clearer if I just show these two pictures. So in 3.9 and previously, this is what it would look like. So if you create a repo, make a commit on master, create a separate branch, and then you go and you prepare a merge commit onto ma on back onto master. But before you merge or submit that merge commit, someone else commits onto master. Uh, if say we have a rebase strategy, a submit strategy. If we clicked on submit, Gary would have actually merged those commits, which is wrong, just plain wrong. It would have made a mess. Um, so now it does the right thing. It rebases uh, that commit onto the main branch and, and then commits it. So for us that we're releasing from Gary 3.5, 3.6, 3.7, 3.8, this saves us an, a huge amount of time. Um, if you've got similar use case in your company, I'm sure it's welcome. Uh, automatically generated suggest edits. So this basically opens the door to having bots suggesting edits. Uh, but what this generate suggestion does is you can have a plugin that implements a certain interface. So Gary only provides the UI for this. You need to create a plugin that implements the interface that this button calls uh, and enable it as a feature, I, I believe. Uh, and then, yeah, you can have a backend there that will suggest you something, right? And, and show it as a, as a suggested fix. Uh, so obviously this open, opens the door to, I don't know, integrating with ChatGPT or whatever else is, is out there, uh, which is something we've started. Well, there's an open source uh, plugin. Do not use it in production. It is not, it is not ready for production. Uh, but this is just an example of what we can do with it. So I can literally, you, well, how it works is you create a ChatGPT user, uh, you give it a token, you give it authorization, and then you literally have a, a chat with ChatGPT in your comment. And it can be like, yeah, is there a spelling mistake here? And it will tell you, yeah, you, you've got a spelling mistake. Obviously this can be a lot more complex. This is, a, it's something pretty cool. And what, how we plan to expand this is to, implement the feature I was talking about a second ago so that ChatGPT can take advantage of it. So what you seem to be saying is right now it's at the level of spell checking, but later it could maybe 
do all the spell checks at once because it has word and and once that are both need to be revised. Or- this I just use a stupid example for spelling, but you could highlight the whole bit of code and say how could I improve this. Uh, it won't generate a suggestion. It will just paste code. So you, it, it's not going to give you like apply edit um, command, but you can have a chat, a chat with ChatGPT and whatever you highlight should be passed over. Uh, what context is given to the backend? Excellent question. Uh, not much at the minute. Uh, I guess only the comment of whatever you've highlighted, but something we intend to work on is providing it the full context so that it can provide much more benefit. Of course, you don't want to send your code to ChatGPT and Microsoft. Is maybe you're not part of Microsoft. You are a competitor, right? So the, what we're working on is actually to make the AI engine pluggable. So it could be ChatGPT, it could be something else, not ChatGPT. You know that some of the companies, they have a lot of AI internally, right? And then maybe you want to reuse your AI capabilities instead of that. So it's not going to be tied specifically to that. The second point related to the context, context is actually very important, right? So there was uh, Shane McIntosh that is doing some research, is a professor that is presenting many times, has presented many times to the summits, is doing research on how ChatGPT is good or not good in providing reviews. And personally, what I've seen that the lack of context is making suggestions pretty much useless. Right. So we are working on also, also on keeping the context between different feedback in a way that the feedback that ChatGPT or any other AI is giving you today is going to be over time more and more relevant because as a specific agent start looking at your code, can start understanding what are the paradigm of your code and what are the paradigm of your project and then start suggesting not common practice, but what's the best practice in this project. So the suggestion for one project could be completely different from the suggestion for a different project, right? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Next steps. So we're currently in RC zero four three ten. Uh, we've got new RCs coming weekly. So the next one goes out on Friday while we're on the plane. So, so most likely. yeah, well tonight or let's hope for good Wi-Fi uh, or we're not going to get much sleep. Uh, final release is due on May ten, and you, you can download RC zero from here. Uh, have we got any questions? I think we can do two or three minutes. I had a quick question on uh, the rebasing of merges. Uh, it's actually been a significant topic in, on the Git list in the past, and Git project actually still does it wrong. I'd argue JJ does it right, but a um, little bit of the mechanism behind it, and like if you have a merge commit that fixes a semantic conflict of some sort, so it's not just a straight merge, but someone had to add in some changes to it, and you rebase it, do those changes come along or is it lost? I know Git, for example, loses those right now. That's an interesting question for Edwi that actually implemented it. So the answer is, I don't know, but yeah, there is something that actually when we saw the features and we put together into the release notes, that was one of the things. So does it do really the reapply of the same conflicts in the same way? The answer is, I don't know. I'm going to check it out and come back to you. But that's an interesting question. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, are you posting, posting the release notes anywhere? I didn't immediately see them on the website. So the answer is, they were in review until last night, right? They have been merged, but they have not been published yet. So, so they will definitely be published. But the final, the initial round of review has been completed. Typically, we start the RC0 with very basic release notes. And I believe that the one that Danny did on RC0 are amazing. A lot better than the ones that I was used to do on the RC0s, right? Okay, okay. So, but yeah, the answer is yes. They're going to be published the RC0 by tonight. And we're going to update for RC1 before RC1 is out. Uh, with the chat GPT thing, you mentioned you were trying to make it extend to other LLMs. Is it that going to be part of the release or just future plans? And um, what about folks who have a license with Microsoft or OpenAI or whatever that have an internal chat GPT, so it's the same interface, but they just don't want it to hit external? So first, bear in mind that chat GPT is not, sorry? Ah, sorry. First, bear in mind that ChatGPT is not part of the Gary release. So it's a non-core plugin, right? So this was initially developed actually for 3.9, but because Gary 3.10 has new APIs for machine learning and AI, so we said, we got in touch with the original maintainer of that plugin. We say, why don't we work together? So we put all the knowledge of integrating more, let's say, tightly with Gary, right? 
and at the same time, so we work in making it more independent from ChatGPT itself, right? So the answer is we are looking for, let's say, feedback and proposals, right? So if you want to know more about all these AI things, we've got some ideas, please do give us feedback because that will definitely influence the direction of the development. So because Garrett has new APIs for AI, we do believe that the community needs to have access to some initial implementation of that. And we are more than happy to do that for you guys.